quality of our No, we retired at the beginning of 2020. Long time database person, perhaps Matt Bruce Russell, he retired just this past November. Uh, what's left, besides myself, is a terrific field person, uh, Scott White. Maybe some of you have met him. I'll mention him a little bit later on. Uh, he's been with us since uh, about mid, early mid 2020, so about a couple of years now. Um, even though I'm new to ASMET, uh, I'm not new to Swap Work Extension. I've been working with the uh, organization now for about five, six, seven years. Uh, previously, I was largely doing projects related to climate and geospatial data information sciences, uh, that realm of topics. Um, but that's not only my background. Uh, part of my background, way back when, does include some plant science and horticulture. Hopefully that's going to make the bridging to having conversations and discuss, discussions about you that much easier. Okay. I'm a little out of range. Or What I do, Kyle? Uh, oh, the guy did not punch you in this room. Oh, so we got to go back to PowerPoint. Yeah. Well, okay. There we go. There Thank we go. you. Okay, to start off, uh, something a little different than uh, previous uh, presentations. A bit of conversation. I'll show of hands. A bit of a big room. How many have heard of asthma? Okay, so maybe half, three quarters. Um, to use it, show my hands at the end. Oh, okay. okay, that's always good. Uh, not as many hands, but you've heard of it. That means we've got some work to do. Uh, which stations do you use? Paloma, uh, so eight, nine, there. Okay, we've got those three Palomas out by Gila Bend. Uh, for those of you who don't know, anybody else want to throw some station names out? Wilcox Bench. Yes, that's right. So uh, about 20 minute drive south of Wilcox. Yes, more or less. Okay. So what name products are you finding most useful? Why do you go there and, and how do you apply that to uh, your, your heat units and eventual transportation units? Okay. So plant development and basically irrigation scheduling. Yeah, making sure we're not overwatering our line. Okay. Very good. Anyone else? Yes, sir. Okay. Very good. Uh, that's something that um, actually came up this week. Uh, we're working on reinstating those. Uh, I'll get to some of the why and how here as far as what we're doing, but uh, those won't be going away. So uh, we'll be, yeah, I'll be getting to that in just a minute. Well, thanks for that. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with ASMET, uh, we have 28 stations in the network. Basically, it's a bunch of environmental sensors that are station-based. Uh, some of those have been around since 1987, if I'm not mistaken. The one here in Maricopa has been here in operation uh, since 1987. Eight of them alone, uh, granted, three of them are in the Phoenix area, eight of them are within Maricopa County. So, at each end of these individual stations, we're measuring air temperature and humidity, precipitation, soil temperature at two different depths, solar radiation, and wind direction and wind speed. Um, from those measurements, we're also calculating a suite of variables, some of which we already heard of. Uh, Chill hours, cotton heat stress values, which is effectively an estimate of the canopy temperature within the plant. Dew point, evapotranspiration, heat units, which we heard earlier, as well as vapor pressure. Right now, we have traditionally what's been called the real time system. Those are observations that are displayed online, they are updated every 15 minutes. We also have a database of hourly and daily values, uh, both the measured variables that I listed earlier, as well as all the calculated variables. There are also, and again, this is going back 
many, many years, a variety of summaries and reports. Um, we had daily data, daily summaries, data, as well as monthly data. One of the reasons um, I was excited to take the job last summer was that uh, we have one, that wealth of data, some of which goes back to 1987. Um, sitting there. That's a very valuable resource. You can do many different things with that, as, as you well know, if you're using the information nowadays. Uh, but also, as I mentioned Scott White earlier, that's another reason why I really liked coming to the position. Scott is, to put it as an understatement, very good at what he does. He brings several years of experience of working with field instrumentation in the scientific setting with him. Uh, he understands all the power, the communications of the stations, uh, working with the individual sensors. He is doing a fantastic job. So if you see one of our stations with that white truck sitting next to it, he's probably out there doing something. You should go up and say hi, tell him he's doing a great job because in fact he is. And uh, ask him what he's up to that day. Uh, some of the things he might be up to. Every quarter he goes to each of the stations in the network and basically checks all the sensors, making sure they're operating within uh, you know, a specified range. He'll roll out a mobile unit of the sensors that he uses to uh, do a side-by-side -side comparison. Making sure the sensors are giving us the values we would expect them to. In addition to the quarterly uh, sensor checks, he's also going to each of the individual stations and basically just doing a quick clean and inspect. Uh, as you can imagine, one of our biggest problems is dust getting on the sensors and um, you know, that potentially causing a problem. Some of our rain gauges have been clogged by just accumulation of dust getting into them. Scott's also working on preventative sensor replacements. Uh, you know, in the past couple of months, for example, he has been switching out the sensors that are measuring wind speed. Uh, those, again, with the dust and other issues, the bearings on them can start to wear and not operate uh, correctly. So he's going to, and before they do fail, going in and changing those sensors out so that maintenance of quality data is still there. As well as some equipment upgrades. Um, he's been working on some of our power supply issues as well as some of the communication issues that we're facing, uh, especially since we work on a cellular network. Cellular networks are stepping up their game to 5G in many areas. We're making sure our equipment communicates with those cellular networks as best as possible. A lot of that goes into what ASMAT has for data quality, which is, I think, one of the um, you know, standout characteristics of the network. And, you know, as these data are coming in, we do have manual as well as a growing automated evaluation of the values that do come in, uh, making sure that what goes into the database is quality data. If it's not, it gets flagged, it gets reviewed, it gets edited so that erroneous values or values, for example, that are out of range for a particular sensor. You know, if Soil temperature sensor gives us a reading of minus 50 degrees. You know that's not true. So we're going to flag that and correct that with the database so that bad measurement doesn't live on to cause us problems later on online. Some of the new stuff we're working on uh, includes a new way to manage the database, new way to pull in the data, new way to store the data, and a new way to access the data. And a lot of that um, is going to be coming up as far as what that all is worth. Um, we're working through a large effort as far as overhauling and modernizing the network. Um, Scott's been doing a lot of that in the field over the last couple of years with his activities. I've come on board with some of the uh, workings of the data behind the scenes. A lot of this is behind the scenes. So if you go online right now, you're not going to see a lot of different things than what you've seen over the past several years. But the new stuff online is coming. We're building the back end we're building the front end in this case. Some of this is going to help us um, easily pull in and make available online the data that some of you had mentioned as far as some of the heat stress or me, the heat units, uh, some of the evapotranspiration numbers. We're going to be able to pull this into uh, you know, web 
interface such that it's easy to assess the data where they're at right now, as well as perhaps, you know, comparison here in the context of cotton heat stress was last year. Again, using the data here to help you with what you experience, uh, you know, put it in your experiential reference, um, your mind as far as, okay, last year conditions were like this, this is how I dealt with the situation. You know, you can compare how that might be this year and whether or not you'll take a different tack or, or the same approach you did last year. So a lot of that is coming up uh, for us. All right, I mentioned that first point, we are gonna be continuing the network overhaul modernization. That's gonna be going on for probably several months uh, without any doubt. We're gonna be continuing to work on the upgrades to the station communications, as well as their power supply. We wanna make sure they are as reliable as possible. Uh, where they are, cellular network constraints and opportunities and so on. We're also going to be keeping uh, up our refinement of this data access and storage system, as well as some of the data quality checks that I mentioned earlier. Also, something I alluded to, we're going to be migrating the existing online resources that ASMAT has to a new desktop and mobile-friendly website. And as with the example of the cotton heat stress in the previous slide, we're going to be developing some new online resources to make the wealth of data that ASMAT has that much more accessible um, and, and quickly attained as far as being able to look at it and help you then make the decisions that you're pulling in the ASMAT data for to help you make those decisions, uh, to make them that much quicker or that much better. Okay. So I, I thought I'd throw this quote up. Um, it struck me as something that was relevant to what we're doing in a way, although we're not doing anything biblical, uh, but we are building things. Uh, we're building the information products that are based on, that are based on the stations and the stations and the station data that are in the network. And again, that's really to help you then make faster decisions or make better decisions. Not that estimate data are going to be all that you're going to consider. You know, if it's just 5 or 10% of your decision, that's okay with us. We're still going to want to help you with that 5 or 10% of your decision-making process. Um, so we're going to wrap up the estimate part real quick and ask, you know, with that previous slide's quote in mind, um, you know, what is estimate missing as far as your operations, your activities, um, something that, you know, just isn't in the data or something that, you know, is in the data, but that we're not drawing out so that you can see it in a readily fashion. But to have predictive modeling for things like when it's impossible to stress it is. I'm glad you read the quote closely because I see predicting rain and I see uh, weather forecasts, and that's not central to ASMAT, that's not our expertise. So we're going to delegate that to the actual experts. But as far as prediction based on the data, I think that's a great point and something that, you know, given some of these stations have several decades worth of data. Uh, that's going to be something we're going to be drawing out. And as far as you know, thinking about average daily temperatures or uh, evapotranspiration amounts, or even uh, you know something like you know average last spring freeze dates or fall freeze dates, things of that nature, that we can certainly pull out. And if you have particular variables or measures that can be pulled out, that would be super useful. Let me know and make sure that they are going into our efforts at putting together the new website and you know, making that information readily available. So that's great. Thank you. Yeah. So would it be possible to predict five and seven days out EPs? We could do that in the sense of pulling in, say, you know, if we're gonna do that for today, pulling in the latest weather forecast, um, seeing what the temperature 
uh, solar radiation, all the variables that go into calculating ATR, and then provide a range of estimates moving forward five to seven days. So that's something that would I have seen before where they're just using the temperature forecasts to predict you know, something like a heat unit accumulation for the next five to seven days to help with thinking about you know, what phenological stage I might be reaching in a week's time. Uh, but right, pulling in some of those extra variables that go into the calculation of evapotranspiration and then you know charting that up, that's something that um, yeah, could be obviously very valuable for bringing that point up here. And uh, something that we could do. So uh, I'll make note of that. That was a great idea. Thanks. Anyone else? Okay. So I know I'm standing between you and break. Um, real quick, right now I'm in between offices on campus in Tucson. Email is the best way to reach me. And I hope I have a permanent phone number soon. All right. Now I said nothing about predicting rain is in our expertise. I don't do that, uh, but I thought to throw in uh, the latest climate outlooks, and of course, as luck would have it, when I put this together yesterday, the ones from May were not out, and what is up here is outdated, but just this morning, they updated the May ones for me, so we're not going to go on what's here on the screen, but uh, here's, here's the latest outlook from the uh, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. <laughs> their Climate Prediction Center. Their uh, latest outlook for May, and again, these are probabilistic uh, forecasts. Uh, we're ahead with there is a slight chance for above normal temperatures in the western half of the state. And as you go east, those chances increase that you're gonna see above normal temperatures over the course of the month. The moderate chances in the eastern half of the state. Uh, for precipitation, you know, May is a dry month. Um, nothing to really get excited about. That's, that's pretty much locked in. But from their standpoint and their toolbox of long range weather forecasting models, um, equal chances for below, near, or above average precipitation for May. If we go back to 2021, uh, as a comparison, you know, we were about zero to two degrees Fahrenheit above normal last May this part of the state, and we were 25, less than 25% of normal precipitation. Again, qualify that with maybe a dry month, but if you remember what last year was like, there are some leanings in the long range forecast right now that May 2022 is going to look potentially like May 2021. For their seasonal outlook, okay, for the seasonal outlook, uh, the three months, again, this is outdated. I uh, just got updates this morning, May, June, and July, moderate to above, or excuse me, moderate uh, for above average temperatures for uh, May, June, and July across almost all of Arizona. And a slight increase above for above normal precipitation for the southern half of the state. There's some indication in the long range forecast toolbox. Uh, and the tools they're in of monsoon coming around uh, rather than not coming around uh, in 2022. Again, these are probabilistic um, forecasts, so you know, take them uh, as such. Okay, so the point of bringing all this up was also one to give you a heads up on some of the conditions we might be expecting moving into May as well as into early midsummer. But also to point you to a particular resource online where I get this information from. Again, I'm not developing these seasonal outlooks. I'm just a messenger in this case. Make sure if those are useful for you in any way, that's where you want to go online to find them. In addition to one month outlooks, which are issued typically mid month, uh, as well as at the beginning of a particular month, and the seasonal outlooks. They also have six to 10 day and eight to 10 day um, outlooks. So in this case here, for April 28th to May 4th, what I grabbed yesterday, uh, you can see here what they're expecting for conditions in Arizona. Uh, slight increase in chances for, uh, let's see, below normal 
temperatures across the extreme southwestern corner, the Yuma area. And then that changes, as you can imagine, going from southwest to northeast diagonally across the state. You know, then your chances are becoming uh, such that there's a slight um, increase in chances for above normal precipitation as you get to that northeastern part of the state. So kind of a mixed bag across the state, eight to ten, eight to fourteen days out. Uh, precipitation. We're looking at equal chances for below, near, or above normal totals for southern Arizona, uh, which I presume is what the interest is here. But if you have any interest in northern Arizona, um, slight increase for below normal precipitation. Out there. I'll leave that up and happy to answer any questions now. I'll also be here during the break, so it'd be great to talk with you this morning. So thank you. It's pretty conversational during, so yeah. Thank you. Thanks again. Okay, let's go for a break and be back at about 11.15. We have the uh, bathroom just outside. If you want to use the pen, go to the Thank you. 